Here we go. <clears throat> All right. We should be live in a second. And here we are. Hi, everyone. It's uh, Emil Guillermo, your uh, favorite museum director, maybe, maybe, possibly. If you're a uh, fan of the Fonz Museum, which is the fan F O F M U, FOFMU. If you're a FOFMU fan of the Fonz Museum, you're in the right place. I'm Emil Guillermo. Hello. Good morning. We, we do these pop ups every Saturday and Sunday at 1145. And uh, Lord willing, it's always his fault, right? Or is, you know, because of him, right? We have no technical glitches. <laughs> if you were around last week, you know that I, I must have spoken for about, I don't know, 10 minutes. And it was like, and and some people were on chat. Some people were on the chat. They were saying, uh, Emil, check your your whatchamajig. Uh, your something's gone wrong. And someone called. Someone actually called. And I thought, oh my God, I didn't block the calls. That's bad. But uh fortunately it was someone saying, Hey, something's wrong. That that that's why we do this. This is everything is everything these days is virtualized live streamed and um, you know we're, we're we're learning how this thing goes and we're here uh doing these uh live streams because it's our way of checking in with you the museum is closed you know uh san joaquin county where the museum is physically on weber avenue right there downtown stockton stockton san joaquin county had the deadliest day ever uh the coronavirus is the number one killer. The number one killer now. Uh, more than diabetes. So more than heart disease. Coronavirus. How did this happen? Maybe it's because we all got together for Thanksgiving. Or not me, but maybe some of you or some of your friends. We're going to see that Thanksgiving spike. We're probably going to see a Christmas spike unless we hunker down and say you know the baby jesus uh will be fine uh if we celebrate on our own this christmas and uh, i'm sure the dreidels will be fine if we celebrate hanukkah i know there's some filipino jews out there you're celebrating hanukkah it's okay if we don't do it in a big celebration because it's a matter of public health right i hope I hope you're thinking that way. I hope you're not one of those people out there who says, I don't need a mask. I usually have a mask right here. I, I don't happen to have my masks with me around, but I, I, I would wear a mask ordinarily right here in my, in my closet. I'm a, it's not a studio, it's a closet. But no, I, I, I just am amazed that there's some people out there who aren't masking up and not taking precautions and uh, you know, when we had at the museum, the green light to go ahead and open a month ago, I thought ah, a little too premature. We, we better wait to see what happens. And sure enough, people got together for Thanksgiving and now we see the spikes just uh, released this morning, Stockton, Stockton Daily Paper, coronavirus, number one killer in the county. So it and it's probably bad wherever you are too. Uh, it's just what's happening throughout the nation. So we're not open, but we do these check-ins. So you see that what's going on in the museum. We're not closed virtually. We're still connecting. We are still sharing stories because, like, uh, I'm fond of saying the museum is where you are. The museum really is where you are. So whether you're in Sacramento, San Francisco, 
Florida, Texas, New York, Hampton Road, Chicago, Seattle, wherever you are. The museum's where you are. And we're a part of that. We're telling the Filipino American story. And so we're going to get into it today. It's connected to virus talk. If you saw some of the things that we posted on the Facebook Live. Uh, but I just want to mention a couple of things before we get to our special guest. And that is we are our Facebook page at Fonz Museum, F-A-N-H-S Museum on Facebook. We, we post different things. We try to tell uh, the Filipino American story over the last week. And we'll talk about this more tomorrow on Sunday on our Sunday brunch version of uh, our pop up. Uh, this week in Filipino American history, key day. Uh, remember, uh, if you go to the Facebook Live, I've been talking about Pearl Harbor and Filipino Americans' response to Pearl Harbor. I think some people know what the response was, but I think many people wouldn't. And that's why I wrote about it in my column on the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund uh, blog and also. Uh, in my column in inquirer.net, the Filipinos were actually happy about the Japanese being scapegoated, the Japanese Americans, because it removed the Japanese Americans as an obstacle from the Filipino Americans climb up the ladder in American society. And it wasn't just the Filipino Americans, it was also the Chinese Americans the Japanese Americans were seen as favored and with them out of the way because of the scapegoating from Pearl Harbor and also the upcoming internment camp decision, the Filipinos were actually kind of happy and they saw their fates and fortunes rise. And a key date is December 13th. We'll talk about that tomorrow on this week in Filipino American history, as well as some other things that are important. That's coming up. We, we like to give these little snippets of history. You can find it here on our pop-ups. Uh, I've been an adjunct professor in journalism, but you know, if this were the Fonz Museum University, I could be an adjunct here too. Uh, we don't necessarily lecture, we talk but we talk about these historical points. So tune in tomorrow on Sunday and we'll get into that. Today though, we have a very special guest and she is a, a journalist. I've known her for, for some time and she has gotten into getting out the information about COVID-19, the coronavirus and the pandemic and also all this vaccine stuff. What's going on with the vaccines? Who's going to get it? Are you going to get it? Say you're going to get it. Are you going to get it? Ah, I think there's some reluctance among some people. Look, uh, did you get your flu vaccine? Now, I must confess, I didn't even get my flu vaccine. That doesn't make me an anti-vaxxer. I just think that we know with the flu... We know that the vaccines of today are for yesterday's flu and it may not protect you from today's flu. So I felt that I wasn't gonna risk it and getting the flu vaccine. I was going to mask up, stay home, lock down. I'm gonna mask in my closet and just not, and just not risk the flu. Now, the coronavirus is something different. And I'm awaiting my turn in line. I don't know when that's going to be. And hopefully our guests can help us figure out when our turn will be. And I hope that it'll give us enough time to decide that, yes, we will get the, uh, the vaccine. Yes, we will get inoculated from this thing. It's still no guarantee, but we should, I'm, I feel much more attuned to getting this than not. And so 
the idea of today's guest is to try to get some information out. And uh, I would like to welcome now uh, a friend of mine, a colleague, uh, Lizelle Tanglao. Lizelle. Hi. Hi, Mel. Hi. Hey, Lizelle, it's, it's, it's good to see you. I, I got to put us in gallery view. <laughs> Hi, Lizelle. Hi. Lizelle is joining us from Southern California. And uh, first of all, thank you for knowing that we're here in the museum. And uh, because you approached me saying, hey, I, I've seen this thing you do. Uh, let me come on your show and talk about this. And but let me first get to your bona fides. Uh, you are a working veteran journalist, and I, I've admired your work. I've seen it online. You've worked at the Huffington Post. You've worked at ABC News. You've worked at a lot of different places. And um, and I, I just wanted to say that uh, we're I'm a lot I'm a lot older than you. And and just to show because some people say, well, where, what's the history part of this, Emil? Well, the history part of this, Emil, is we're dealing with two Filipino American journalists and just the idea of how Filipinos are in journalism. You see between myself and Lizelle examples of what happened between 19, the 1970s and 2020. You see a completely different landscape of the media and you still see Filipinos. I don't know, there are Filipinos in the media now, there's more, but how would you say the diversity is in terms of Filipino Americans in the media now? Lizelle? Not enough. I mean, there's definitely more. I mean, when I started, um, you know, my first full-time job in journalism, it was, a, it was early 2000s and I could still count on my fingers the amount of Filipinos I ran into in the business. And I always try to cap, you know, a mental note because there's so few of us, you know? Yeah. Um, there's a lot more now and that's promising, but we have a long way to go. And I think the key is not only getting us on the front lines on the ground, but put people and position them in key de decision-making places so that we're, it's not a struggle and fight to try to get our stories out there, you know, in the mainstream press yeah. as well as local and yeah. all those places. I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, it, it is a fight and it's a, it's ridiculous. I mean, to think that in 2020, right. I mean, you're saying this, right. And when I first imagine what it was like for young Emil Guillermo coming up from, you know, from San Francisco, born in America, like you born in America to Filipino immigrants. My father happened to be slightly more than an immigrant because he was a, he came as a colonized American, right, in the 20s. But still, had to come here, married my mom. You know, here I am thinking, oh, the world is my oyster in the 70s. How many Filipinos did I see in the media when I went into anything, radio, television, newspapers? You know, usually zero. Zero. Yeah. Right. And um, I, I just recall in, uh, in the set, when I, when I made it into the San Francisco market, there was one other another Filipino. He worked at the independent station, not at the network station. I was the first one to work at a network affiliate in San Francisco. At that time, it was KRON. No Filipinos. A number of Chinese, like three, three Chinese. So Asian Americans were there. First Filipino American. And um, that was 1981 that I was at, at, at Kron. And I'm thinking, boy, we're talking 40 years, right? And we get to your statement where you're saying there's still not enough. It's like, I didn't do enough. You know, I had a foot in the door. I tried to crack open the door for everyone else and the flood didn't happen because what was I? I was just a reporter. I was just, I, and I, I grew up, I, I mean, I became uh I went to NPR and I did some anchor stuff there, but I was not in management. And I guess that's the key. Do you think management's the key? I think it's one path. I mean, yeah. there's several paths, right? We need both. We need people on both ends, folks that are actually out there getting the story, reporting, uh, being in the community. But we also need 
people that are essentially gatekeepers right now, which is where the struggle is, just trying to even make the case that this is a story. And we know it is, but it's like trying to convince people, I mean, is, is a challenge sometimes. So, yeah. Isn't that, isn't that funny that when I was um, at Channel 4 in San Francisco, whenever, th whenever anything happened to a Filipino in the news, like a Filipino killed, one time a, a Filipino shot up an office, killed his wife. Pretty famous case in the 80s, uh, big, big office building. And they, they identified him as Filipino. The first thing they did is come to me. Emil, do you know this guy? Well, yeah, I know all the, I know all the Filipinos. Well, We're that, all related, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, that was the assumption, right? right. Uh, and, you know, the thing is, we were in a three network universe, just three, no cable. There was no internet. And the, I was the Filipino on the NBC affiliate in San Francisco. And that was like an amazing amount of reach because no one saw anything else. I mean, there was no iPhone. There was no, think of all the different media sources. And I, you know, I would be stopped at more than just Sarah Monty up here. And then people say, oh, they're Filipino. You know, and now I can see where there's so many more outlets, cable, internet, and yet you still don't see quite the diversity on the mainstream like we should. And yeah. we, we can't even sell the case that these are American stories, that they have Filipino subjects. Yeah, I mean, it's a struggle all along. And also just the fact, and I know we're gonna get to this, it's just the, the lack of data about us, which is usually one of the main factors when you are pitching a story to your editor. They always want us, they always want it to be bad. And it makes sense, you know, but the fact that it's even a struggle trying to find information about us is quite alarming, to be honest, since we have such a long history with um, the US in many different facets, you know, right. from the, the, the first recorded point of contact, right, in the 1600s here to colonization, you know, uh, as America's colony. So it's kind of, it's kind of wild to think that even with all that, and even with where we are at in the population, you know, being the third largest Asian subgroup um, in the US, there, we still find it a struggle. We could probably count on our hands um, how much, you know, studies or surveys that are specifically done on Filipinos here in the US. Yeah, yeah you're, and you're talking about disaggregating us from the, the overall Asian American thing. So we, f we can figure out, you know, how many Filipinos. And, you know, what you said <clears throat> just there, kind of alarming. We used to be number two. We were number one at one point. What happened to our Catholicism? We're just not, our birth rates are falling. <laughs> but when you said third, I said, oh my God, the, the, the Indians, the South Asians have caught up, right? That yeah, so it's Chinese American, Chinese um, Indians, uh, and then us, yeah, we're third. You know, yeah. And, and this is an historical movement. I mean, a lot of this, you know, I, I really wanna do, if I'm still director of the museum, at some point, I really would like to do something called Balitang, where we talk about the news and how the news is disseminated, how the news has a part in history, right? It is the first draft. And how important, like you said, you know, from the first recorded landing of Filipinos or, you know, Asians, well, 1600, uh, 1587, the 1600s, right? Right here in California to, colonization, we have a role and a lot of people don't even see us. They don't even know of our historical relationship. Well, even even within our own community sometimes oh, too. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. but yeah, just in general, like we, we kind of are, if we're lucky, we're even a footnote in the American history books, which we deserve way more than that. And I think, well, um, you know, well, well, that's why, you know, the Fonz Museum, the Filipino American National Historical Museum is, is an important thing. It's got to be a bigger thing, but until it is, I mean, we're here and we're trying to tell these stories. And I just think that, you know, this is a unique perspective to have a young reporter like yourself, 
who's here, and then slightly older reporter here talking about these things. It's not just war stories. It really is our American horror story about trying to penetrate the media so that we can disseminate and get our stories out. Hasn't been easy. Certainly has not. It's been an ongoing challenge, but we still persist because we know this is important. I mean, we, we matter and our voices matter. And I think we, 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 ha we can't give up. I mean, you know, we are, we are just as American as everyone else. And I think, you know, if we're not, I, I think we attack it on both ends. You know, we, we're, we can't wait for everyone else to tell our stories. I mean, we gotta, we gotta just take back that narrative, but at the same time, somehow hopefully push through so that we can be that influence and change, you know, that it's like, it's not simply a Filipino story. It's also part of the larger American narrative. So yeah, it is. Yeah. And America and America, you know, the actions of, you know, the policies of America dictated how involved, how not involved we were. I mean, you can go back to, from the colonization to the, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, 1934 Tidings McDuffie Act to uh, the, the FDR saying, come on, veterans, come fight with the Americans to the Rescission Act of 46 to the Immigration Act of 65 that said, OK, all those racist quotas we put on Filipinos, let's get rid of them and let's let them all in in 65. And really, that's where most of the immigrants do come in at post 65 and now we have backlogs and we have, you know, and, and now we have a whole group of Filipino Americans who really start coming in around 2000. That's yeah. At one generation, 20 years. And that's why we have a kind of almost like we're recycling our pattern, our path. I've been thinking about that recycling pattern uh, for a long time but you know we are now we we have generations of filipino americans and we just don't we're not that it's a bad thing but there's now more immigrants than there are F filipino american american born filipino but you know uh, the guy in superstore you know nico santos yeah the uh, i'm a filipino in the closet he's a filipino out of the closet uh my closet is a different kind of closet, but Nico, Nico, I, I was looking at his biography and he calls himself an American Filipino, mm. which is a term that I've been using in my columns, not strictly religiously, but I, I first wrote my, my first American Filipino column, maybe what, 10 years ago, because I wanted to distinguish between born here and not born here. Uh, but anyway, another subject, Lizelle, thank you for uh, allowing me to talk about this, but, but you represent this new generation in, in media and the fact that you're doing not media, but you're doing this other thing. I thought it, it brought up this idea about what's wrong with the media, what's wrong with, you know, what we're doing. So you're a journalist yes, and you've started, we see from the background, Tayo, we see the caretaker project, we see you're reaching out and it has to do with the, the virus and it has to do with the vaccine. I, tell me, tell me how you got into this idea that you through your project will be disseminating this information out to the Filipino community. I guess it's related to the fact that the mainstream community isn't doing it for the Filipino community. I think you hit it on the nail. Absolutely. Um, that's, we're trying to fill a space that is currently not there for our community. And really the origin story of um, the caretaker project and the Tayo help desk really actually started, I would say even a year ago last year. Um, I was uh, chosen as one of the delegates of uh, PhilPro, which is the Filipino Young Leaders Program. So it's very similar to a lot of young leader programs that a lot of countries have with the US where you go back to the motherland for like a week and you meet with, um, you know, government officials, community members, things like that. And, you know, it's interesting when I look back and I still, I still stand by this. It's, it's, it's one of those like trips that can tra completely transform and change your life. And that's what that trip was for me. Um, so, you know, and I think a lot of it has to do with um, the other folks 
that were on the trip with me, other young professionals that are at the top of their game in different industries. So, I mean, I was the sole journalist in my group, but we had, you know, we had lawyers, we had doctors, we had a judge. I mean, we had tech people. It runs the gamut. And I think what was really interesting for a lot of us, um, and it was for me, I, I had only been to the Philippines once um, before because I was born here in um, Southern California. And it's a different experience when you go back to the motherland um, without family, you know, and you realize that, you know, your family protects you from a lot of things. But when you go back with other folks that are within your age group, um, experiencing the same thing you are, it's very transformative and powerful. So, you know, when we returned um, from that trip, our, our group is pretty tight. I mean, we're still very tight. And we started to, um, you know, talk to other alumni of the program from other years. And I think they also had similar experiences. Um, but, but yeah, so when the pandemic rolled around in the spring, I think, you know, we went from talking on a regular basis to almost daily, twice daily calls, like, um, you know, on Zoom and, you know, trying to figure out and basically compare stories within um, our own circle about like, you know, when those first shelter at home orders came down, you know, we all were trying to figure out, well, how do we respond to this? Because every single one of us either knew somebody that was affected by COVID-19 or had coworkers, or even like our Lolos and Lolas, our Titas and Titos were, weren't listening. They were like going out when they shouldn't have been. They are like the most vulnerable in the population. And, you know, like our group, we're, we're just like trying to figure out, well, what do we say to them? How can we get them to stay home? You know, yeah, so were they yeah. looking, were, they, were, the, were your relatives looking at the news or were they how were they were they processing the information that was was coming from traditional sources and just ignoring it? Or were they saying I'm invincible? I'm well, I don't need to bother. What, what was their response? I think it was a little bit of combination of both. Right. I think there was a little bit of the religious end. It's like, oh, no, it's going to be fine. You know, um, I think it was just like, oh, I don't understand what is what is what is this virus, you know, or it was more of like, eh, you know, this is not really a big deal. I'm, I'm going to still go see my barcada. Right. But it's and we knew and it's almost became a reverse role reversal where where we I felt like we were the adults, you know, the, these young professionals in the group telling our older generation our titos and titas and lolas and lolas to like stay home, stay grounded, but yet they weren't listening. So this was very, this was very like alarming to us. And then add into it the, the amount of misinformation that was being shared. And, you know, this isn't a new thing. Obviously misinformation has just been going around for a while now, but when the pandemic hit, uh, especially early on, there was, you probably have seen that graphic that was like, oh, you know, gargle hot water and then you'll cure COVID. That was being shared so frequently through Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp. And it was like, this is, this is, this is insane. Like there's gotta be a way, like there, there's gotta be a way we can stop this. So, you know, we started asking ourselves that question and then also just more on like a more holistic note, like, you know, as Filipinos, we like to get together. We like to have big parties. There's this, you know, we thrive and being physically close to each other. So we were also trying to answer the question, how can we be together when we can't, you know? And then also just knowing our sheer numbers and, you know, representation in the medical field and essential roles. Like, no wonder we were getting disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 because we're, we're the nurses and doctors treating all these patients. And then um, we're out there delivering mail. We're out there, you know, restaurant workers, grocery store workers, and then we go home to our intergenerational families where our Lola is there, you know, and our aunts and uncles. So it's no, it's not a surprise that we were getting hit hard, but we also started asking ourselves, well, okay, if we're so busy in these caretaking type of roles, who's taking care of the caretakers, right? And that's where I think that's where this whole thing started, where you know, basically posing the question to the to the group, I, I sit on the Philpo board saying, what was our response? What are we doing about it? And essentially um, by May, April, uh, we decided to form a COVID-19 task force within Philpro. Um, and basically I got tapped to lead that. And since then I was like, all right, well, let's let's do it. Like this is, 
this is where we have actually control, you know, like we can, we, the one virus that we can't stop is misinformation. Let's, let's see what we can do about that. You know? All right. So, so tell me what are the top bits of misinformation and what is the correct thing? So if there's a top three points of misinformation that you've recognized in the Filipino community that's being spread around, what would, what would that, what would they be? And what is the correct information? Yeah, I think one off the bat is like, um, you know, these home remedies, right? Like, oh, if I take ginger tea or if I drink X or something and do it for this many times, um, I I'll get cured. And, you know, that it seems simple that it's like, of course that's fake, but I can't tell you how many times that we've seen this in the community, right? So, you know, obviously the, the true, <laughs> the, the factual answer to that is no, there isn't <laughs> a downright cure, but, you know, we do know that there's advances with the vaccine and those things that have recently passed approval that, which is hopefully rolling out, right? All right. Now, one thing I will say in defense of ginger, because, <laughs> uh, you know, I did talk to a nurse, a Filipino nurse who did tell me that he, to fight off COVID, uh, while he was, you know, doing his thing at, at the at the hospital, he'd come back home, he'd put garlic around the the house. And, you know, I don't know if it worked. He said he did some research. But all right, it's it's it seems to me that you might be able to fight inflammation, you might be able to, you know, if you eat the garlic and eat the, the herbs, it might help help your health in general. It will not defeat COVID. It right. will not. It will not cure you from COVID. But it might, as a matter of general health, not be a bad thing. Sure. But it's not the cure. It's Absolutely. not. Yeah. So, like, I think it being it be, positioning it as a cure is completely inaccurate. You know. So it's things like that that can have life changing consequences, right? So I think that's the number one thing that comes to mind. Um, I'm trying to think what other ones. But yeah. you know, like trying to like address those type of things that we know are not true. And then also like, how do we kind of emphasize the, the social distancing, right? And I know that's tough because we're so used to like celebrating together as a community, but you know, to the only way you can ensure safe, being safe and not like in unintentionally spreading COVID is staying home, staying within your pod, you know, your, the, your bubble, essentially the people in your household. Because you don't know. And that's the thing. I think we're still, I mean, I think science has moved really rapidly, but there still isn't really, the, that's the only way you can really ensure that, right? So so. How do you how do you tell that to your Lolo and, right. Lola and say, look, uh, you know, you know, my, my you know, Ate is not going to come today because she's going to stay, you know, quarantined in her home. She's not going to come visit. How do you, how do you uh, communicate to the elder that this is the right way to go about doing things. Yeah, so that's where essentially when we started figuring out, trying to figure out and brainstorm, how do we answer this? Um, the What came out of it was it started from like building a community resilience playbook to now what you see now, what is now live, kyohelp.com. And a lot of it has to do to, to really be intentional about the messaging, right? So like, how do we make sure we culturally tailor this information? So, you know, a lot of the information we have on tayohelp.com, it's not like proprietary, you know what I mean? Like you can easily go find this anywhere else, but what is different is that we really try to make sure it's culturally tailored. What I mean by that is we think about who is our target audience we're trying to reach. And in, in this instance, it's like Lola or Ate or whoever it is. And you can't just like basically read off something from the CDC. Like, yes, the CDC's guidelines are, you know, factual, they're reliable, but they're dry and dense. You gotta, and, and what I like to, to say is that we, you gotta have to add a little bit of that hugot, right? That, that emotional like tie to it um, that's nuanced within our community. So it could be something as simple as like, you know, uh, you know of course, like offering other alternatives to um, having that same interaction. Of course, it's not the same, but like offering alternatives to like, here's other ways that you can visit with your Apo, right? Like have like a, like a virtual party or something like that. Um, but also understanding like, you know, 
the level of respect. Uh, there's the language is 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 very powerful. Just the way you say it without being patronizing. You but, know? but so. now Tayo means us, and the, exactly. the website again is tayohelp.com. Tayo. So people can go to the website, get information. But it's as you put it, it's culturally sensitive to Filipino Americans specifically. Yes, and we also just rolled out with um, there's Filipino translations, um, basically Tagalog translations of the majority of our Q and A's. Um, you know, we're looking for another round of funding to to hopefully and expand this. Um, our pilot is in Los Angeles. Um, our pilot ends the end of this month. Um, we got initial funding from the Booz Allen Foundation, so we're hoping to unlock more funding either from them or elsewhere so that we can expand this to other parts of the US, as well as, um, you know, get more translations done, because we know not everybody, you know, speaks Filipino, Tagalog, like, you know, there's Kapampanga, Ilocano, Cebuano, Ilongo, like, so that's another level of accessibility that we're trying to offer that is not really currently out there. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's, that's good. I mean, because you're, you're based in LA around uh, uh, Carson, big Filipino area there. Uh, what, what, most of the people in Carson are from, hail from where? Are they all over Manila or? I think they're all over. So yeah. I think, uh, you know, a perfect example, like, um, and that's the thing about not, not having de-aggregated information or that information is not being asked, right? So I think, for example, if we were able to fully expand to Hawaii, I think it is absolutely crucial to offer Ilocano translation, oh, yeah. right? E so, even here, even here in, well, yeah. in Stockton, you'd want Ilocano, you'd also want Visayan, right? Absolutely. So and, I, I think, I mean, I'd have to look at the census and see if it breaks it down that far, that granular, but again, it's like, you know, that's part of, that's part of the thing that we were trying to, you know, propose as part of this project, right? It's, it's not enough that we are pushing out content that we culturally tailor and curate, but we also saw this as an opportunity to improve content, like improve data about us. So what we are doing as part of that is, um, you know, things like the vaccine, right? So in doing, when we launched uh, a couple of weeks after we launched, we started doing some user interviews. And um, we also started getting anonymous questions um, in, within our platform asking about the, the vaccine. And to be honest, at the time, this is before Pfizer or any of those folks started, um, you know, releasing their news that it's it's they're at a good they're at a great spot. I wasn't even thinking about the vaccine. I was thinking, oh, it's never going to come. It's going to be wild. Um, but it was very clear in doing these user interviews that every single person we talked to, we talked to, to about a dozen people, they independently brought up the vaccine. And that was a signal to us that this is a concern within the community. And it's made us started, started to think like, all right, if this is a concern, how do we address it? How do we get ahead of it? When, we, when the time comes, when it's time to roll out like widely for this vaccine. So um, one of our core members uh, within the group uh, on our team, uh, Dr. Melissa Palma, who's based out of Illinois, um, she's leading uh, another subcommittee uh, within our project to, to basically prepare a nationwide vaccine um, study uh, um, survey around Filipinos' attitudes around vaccines. Because we checked, there isn't anything, any literature or data around that. I mean, the last thing that was done around Filipinos and vaccine was like in 2016 on in Hawaii on HPV. Yeah. I bet your suspicion, your suspicion is that people will be reluctant to to get vaccinated. I mean, I think anecdotally, I think we can say um, and again, this is why we don't want to assume we'd rather like, let's do it the right way. And let's try right. to survey it. Um, yeah, I mean, I just even by our um, you know, our very non-scientific user interviews, there is a level of hesitancy of like, and I think a lot of it could stem, if we want to talk about history, um, you know, folks that lived through that era, uh, um, like, you know, in, in martial law or whatever, the, the distrust of the, of the government, as well as something more recent. Um, there was a, a vaccine um, mishap um, in the Philippines around dengue, 
the dengue vaccine. So there's already already like a precedent here about just mistrust within the community on, on depending on what generation you're in yeah. about like, is this something we can trust? Is this actually safe? You know, this is a it's it's strange because there have been so many waves of immigration to America and so many different uh, versions of autocratic rule in the Philippines and relationships to government, right? I mean, because right now we have a more autocratic ruler in the Philippines, but people tend to like what he's doing. People tend to say, hey, uh, extrajudicial perhaps, but we treat trust and we like, we like, this is what people will say about the former mayor of Mindanao, who's now the president of the Philippines, which is a lot, it's not that much different from Marcos because there were people here who were both pro and anti-Marcos. And so a lot of it is like, I don't know what kind of response you're going to get about who exactly are on the anti-vax side and who are on the vac vaccine side. Like yeah, I mean, this is why you say you have to survey, but I would suggest that maybe the nurses, the frontline people, the doctors and nurses, maybe they would be, you know, pro-vaccine and, you know, me, I, I don't want to say the necessarily the, the less educated, but maybe those who are away from the front lines and, you know, who maybe have more distrust, maybe they're anti-vaccine, but we, we don't know. But what, we don't know. And yeah. that's the thing. The fact is we don't know because there hasn't, again, the lack of data and the lack of de-aggregated de data. I mean, we could have been asked this in larger data polls, but again, it's not de-aggregated. How would we really know? You know, yeah. so we're taking it upon ourselves to um, basically prepare that, put that up for our IRB um, approval so that we can launch it in Q1. And hopefully from there, depending on what that analysis is and what, what the results of that, we, we are, we're looking to use that as a way to inform how we make sure we message out like and give the most accurate information to our community so they can make the most informed decision. All right, how about right now? Right now we have the news, vaccines, they're gonna get approved, we're gonna get them soon. We don't know where we are in line. No. There's gonna be, a, in, in California, there might be a couple million, I hear, doses around. I don't know if it's gonna be the, the dosage or the, uh, the vaccine that requires the extreme cold, or if it's, you know, if it's the Pfizer or the Moderna, Pfizer seems to be on a fast track. What do you tell people now if they go to tayohelp.com and say, what do I do? Do I just hang in there? What do you tell them about, about vaccines now? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what we're trying to figure out, right? Because we don't want to be alarmist, alarmist but we also don't want to say something that is not. And it, it and it's also depends where you are, because every jurisdiction, every state, every even city has a different rollout schedule. So I think we're in the process of trying to figure out what that um, what that messaging looks like, at least for now, until we have a clear a clear picture. And I think it's important to caveat that by this is a fast moving situation. I think no one could have ever predicted that like, you know, what happens today, like today or tomorrow, you know, it's going to be completely different. So it's not any by any measure, anything that we've seen before. But I think that's why it's even more important to have like a a resource like this, you know, so. So right, right now, if people go to tayohelp.com to get information, what kind of information do you provide now? What could you tell them? Uh, yeah. Give me three things that they would, they could learn right now that, that would make them go for, for more. At yeah. Tayohelp. So obviously it's, 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 it's an entire resource around COVID-19. I mean, you, you can go there for basic like information of what COVID-19 is. But it's also everything that has been impacted by COVID-19. So there are information around there about things that we probably don't talk about enough in our community, such as mental health, um, even looking at the data on um, the back end. I mean, those are one of our most traffic. That section is probably one of our most traffic um, sections on the site. Um, you know, meaning, also meaning what in terms of uh, mental health, meaning how to get help or what what sort oh. of symptoms. What, what would you what, what would you say? Yeah, so it's a little bit of both. Like, where can I get resources, right? And then also, like, you know, we have, like, questions and answers of, like, oh, I'm a senior. I'm feeling lonely. How can I cope? Or I'm feeling I have a lot of anxiety. What can I do? 
Um, we're about to launch a, a round of um, Q and A's on um, around the holidays because again, that's another opportunity where it's like it's not a normal it's not a normal year. Yeah. So it may not be the wisest to go visit Lola because you know if she's not already living in your household, like may not may not be wise to do that. So so we have you know articles around that. We also have articles around like travel, like. Is it safe to go to the Philippines right now? Or well, wait, wait, hold it, hold it. Is it safe to go to the Philippines right now? <laughs> well, it, it's like it, it can. It depends on what you know category you fit into because there's certain regular. You know, you may not be even allowed to get in. I mean, they've kind of eased it a little bit. Um, safe. I mean, I guess it depends on who you ask and what your level of threshold of safety, right? Um, I mean, I, I guess where, travel isn't is is still prohibited to between um i think it, they've loosened up a little bit i mean for a while it's just been restricted to just filipino citizens or unless you're a dual citizen right. um but i think you still have to have some type of you know connection or, or whatnot to so, um, to well, but, but what you're saying is that if if you have a question if people out there have a question about about anything about the coronavirus and they can go to tayohelp.com and get what would in you say you said mental health was like a biggie what what are the other two um so there we have legal resources we also have uh things around um because our our main um target demographic it, it's filipinos right but it's also three uh sectors within the filipino community so our senior citizens our frontliners and then the unemployed and the unemployed that's very broad in that sense so there's resources around oh i got laid off how do i you know, how do I file for unemployment? Or I'm a gig worker, what can I do to get some relief? You know, so it's really encompassing of the impacts of COVID-19 on your life, not just like physically, not your just your health, but everything that's tied to it. So your job, um, you know, if you're a small business owner, like how can I apply for like Care Act, you know, resources, you know, things like that, or your stimulus check. So, you know, we're, we're constantly adding more each, each, each week um, based off of like what we're seeing. And then if you, if you can't find an answer to your question or if your question is not there, uh, there is a function where you can ask us a question and then it gets filtered and pushed to our subject matter experts. And that's the other thing I should add. We're not just posting anything. Like everything that gets published on the platform itself goes through a rigorous review process. It gets reviewed by a panel of professional um, experts within their field. So, like the med, like we are, we're not doctors, you know, we're not lawyers, but it gets reviewed by folks that are in those fields to make sure this is accurate. Um, you know, we're not certainly advising anybody of this, but this is just factual information, and then it gets edited and then it gets published. All right, so, so it goes through a almost a journalistic process. Yes. Right, and mm -hmm. this is where your your acumen as a journalist comes in. Yep. Tell me about. All right, so we talked about the virus and talked about some tips. The vaccine, though, what are you saying now about the vaccine? If people go to tayohelp.com, what do you tell people now about how to approach the vaccine? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty broad right now because I think because this 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 news keeps changing every day. So I think we're gonna we're probably gonna push another update to have a little bit more uh, clarity in terms of like here's 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 all what we know. Here's what we know as of now. I think if you go there now, it's just very broad. It's a fast moving situation. So that is one of our top things that we need to to update, right? Because it's 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 like I feel like it keeps changing every five minutes. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, as people move for emergency level approvals and yep. then yep. Um, to know where you are in line, I guess uh, seniors first, or you know, the older you Front are, liners, yep. you know, you'll, you'll get access. So by the time it gets to, you know, uh, young people like me and younger people, like you, we'll, we'll be we'll be further back. But yeah. you know, one of the things that come that comes up about the vaccine is that there's been this amazing race to get the vaccine out there. They've saved, um, they've skipped over a number of animal studies, and that really, actually, that's been good for the animals. Uh, it. It could be good for 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 us as humans because well, but we don't know. I mean, the the animals wouldn't have helped us because 
animals get certain things that you know that that humans don't but it did help speed up the process but we still i mean the 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 overarching question is we still don't know what right the virus will do i mean the, the other day they were talking about rashes rashes don't mean that you're allergic to it but it's just a reaction I mean, do you get into that level? Do would you tell folks yeah, and that's, to react that way? Yeah, and that's kind of the disclaimer. We there's still a lot we don't know about it, but this is what we know as of now, right? So that's where it gets a little tricky. So I think also I should mention this is why you know I'm trying to bring in some additional reinforcements on our end because a lot of our content uh, is done by us as uh, volunteers. Um, you know, we are practically a volunteer, all volunteer group. Um, minus our um, folks that help us build the platform. Um, we contracted with a company in um, the Philippines, Caliber. So they've been, um, they're, they're funded through the grant that we got, but everyone else that's been working on this project have been volunteers. So yep. from folks that are professionals um, in different fields, as well as uh, we have brought on a amazing group of college, uh, college student fellows that are from all over the US, as well as in the Philippines to help us um, write some of this content. So, um, you know, with that being said, at, you know, as one of the only um, like journalists on this project, you know, I'm like, all right, we need to get additional reinforcement. So we actually um, just signed an agreement with um, KPCC, uh, LAS, um, the NPR affiliate here in Los Angeles. So oh. um, we have a syndication agreement with them and we're gonna work closely with them to, because um, they also set up a, uh, a help desk uh, back in March here, um, but also like, you know, looking at what content that we can use from them to help supplement or add to our existing content and also tailor it for our needs. So um, we're looking forward to starting starting that partnership with them. So. Well, well that's, that's great. You know, a lot of these things, the best things for the community sometimes are the, the volunteer efforts. I mean, I can speak from personal experience here at the at the museum uh totally all volunteer effort and um it just means that you can't go as fast as you like to go right. but you go as fast as as the community allows and that requires grants and donations and whatnot totally so. but it's been amazing to see because it's like you know everyone's putting so much time and effort in this but i think it's it's just validating and it's just a a symbol of like we all know what it's, what is at stake here and why we're doing it and yeah. you know people giving up their weekends to meet weekly i mean we've met weekly ever since may it's been like 32 weeks straight of meeting every week on this project to make sure we are on track to make sure we are up to date to make sure how else can we you know keep this going and not let this thing die because we know that this is beyond ourselves and you know it goes back to the name of the help desk it's us um you know it's us it's tayo it's us so by helping us really you know it's it's a highly you know this is like tech speak but it's a highly scalable project because we know it not only helps us as a community but it helps us in the larger human sense right and um the big the big takeaway goal beyond just helping our community um, is also making sure what the lessons we learn through this whole entire process is that we're sharing that a lot of knowledge sharing because a lot of communities that are probably in similar situations like the Filipino community can learn a lot from what we've the challenges that we've we're, we've been facing as well as some of our early wins in terms of like um, how do we respond to these things um, so it's like and getting to a point where it's not so reactive but more proactive and it, that comes into play with this whole community resilience. I mean, ultimately, I think, you know, the overall goal, well, once hopefully we get past COVID, post COVID, um, we would love to see this platform pivot to something that is really what we're building now, right now is this, you know, information infrastructure that doesn't exist within our community so that we are fully prepared when there's another, God forbid, another crisis or disaster we need to respond to, whether it's here in the US or in the Philippines, that we, we can easily activate this immediately. Because I always feel like we always know there's a typhoon or typhoons that come through the Philippines every year. At the same time, there's always some brush fire here that's affecting our cup of or something. But yet I always feel like we're always scrambling. And 
we can save a lot of effort and time if we already know who's there, who's been vetted, who's reliable, and just like literally turn it on, on you know. Yeah, just well, turn it on as needed. A network yep. of a, ne a network on online of yep. Filipino Americans. You know, you look at it and you say, "Well, shouldn't that already exist already with organizations?" I mean, we have a federation of organizations and associations, and I guess it does, but it doesn't. I mean, it's kind of ad hoc. I mean, yeah, it's always ad hoc. And I mean, it, I feel like there are, and I'm not saying there isn't, there are, but there isn't one like system infrastructure in place that connects everything though. Cause I feel like I always find out about things after the fact and I wish I would have known, oh, that organization's already doing that. Okay, let me not like, you know, let's just double down on that effort versus trying to reinvent the wheel. You know what I mean? So it's like- Yeah, I mean, if we, yeah. if there was some kind of pipeline that was throughout and everyone was connected, it would be a lot easier and simpler, Absolutely. but, but all right, but here's the question. Would that run counter to a, the nature of Filipino Americans and how they, I mean, this is, this is the, the thing, right? I mean, uh, you could, but then it, but at the same time, I always feel like that's part of what being Filipino is. I mean, I will say, um, I don't know, Neil, you might find this interesting. So when we went for the Booz Allen foundation grant, for example, there was three out of 3,000 applications, right? They only funded 21 projects. We were one of the 21. And, and out of the, out of the 3,000 applications, we were the only proposal that focused on one specific group. So that basically means every single proposal they got went very broad. And like when we were getting to the finals, semifinals, quarterfinals, and we were preparing for the final pitch to Booz Allen, like, you know, of course we got some feedback from some folks um, that were like, well, maybe you should broaden the, the scope. And, you know, we thought about it, but at the end of the day, we're like, no, 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 this, this impacts us uniquely in our community. We're not gonna broaden this. This is, this is something that's really impacting us in, in a very unique way. So we, we decided to double down intentionally and like, like really embrace our Filipino-ness. And, you know, that's what actually got us through all the way at the end. Because after how many cuts, cuts over and over, it was still us. And when you really think about it, I like to say that, you know, Filipinos are like the OG innovators, right? You can't tell us we've survived this long from, you know, revolutions, colonization, wars without being innovative, like going to other countries, starting new lives, right? Yeah. You know, we adapt and we pivot. And, and that's a lot of that is power. That's what innovation is you know it's not something completely new it's taking what's there and looking at it and from a different approach you know yeah. and this is what we are looking at this well, i'm i'm interested in that story because you know one of the things um i mean we've known each other for for some time in through the journalism wars or the transformation yeah. of the media landscape and uh when i got your email I had seen the headline somewhere. I didn't know it was attached necessarily to you. I just, when I first read the, the, the headline, I think a couple of weeks ago, and then I got your email. I said, oh, this, this is Lizelle Singh. And I have been asking here as museum director, just asking people, you know, I was, I've been telling people, take a picture of, of, of your lives and what you're doing and how COVID is affecting you yeah. because it's, your selfie today will be history tomorrow because his, it's history now. And I want to know what Filipino Americans are doing now during COVID as a response to this, because this is an historical moment and how we respond will be studied or looked at as either, oh, they did nothing or they did something or right. they did something really extraordinary. And you know, I have to say that your recognition of this and you're doing this project is, uh, this is an historical thing. If, if you can do it, it would be a kind of a, a uniting thing within the community that we, we just don't have today. Yeah, that's today, but 
what about tomorrow, right? So well, I don't think I don't think we've ever had it, and I think it's something that we need, you know, not just today, but also for tomorrow. I Absolutely. mean, I mean, when uh, I remember when you talk about uh, you know Typhoon Haiyan, right? When that hit, uh, usually people heard of it first, Twitter, Facebook, you know, social media, right? Start and then it then it became a thing on the the network newses, cable news, but they didn't really cover it as much because, you know, they're they're focused on whatever little political thing is going on, very myopic, and maybe CNN International covered the hurricane, right. but CNN, you know, big CNN, what's domestic, right. not you know, they didn't really cover, and I remember placing a piece on Hyann in. CNN, the the website, right? An opinion piece about what's going on or how Americans were responding to what was going on. But really there's, if there was one network of things or, or one network that pulled us together so that we could be in touch, like we, just, there was another storm, right? Yeah. And if you don't hear about it and if you don't have relatives telling right. you that there's a, how do you respond? You, you you don't so you know i i admire what you're doing Giselle. well it's not me alone so I let me let me purpose this by saying it's well, i know i know it's not you alone i just want to make sure this is definitely a collective effort uh within our with uh within phil pro and our our task force that is not just made up of phil pro alumni but other folks in the community that also saw the need and you know answered the call to action so I, I like I, this is why I love that we we decided to call the help desk us because it is us. It's not an us is plural, not just a singular, you know, person or whatnot. But yeah, yeah, it's been it's just been an honor to just lead this to lead this project because you know you and I know the power of information. Oh yeah, much I I, has, I, so. I know it's a collective effort. I know that, it, but I I just think it's it's great that Filipino Americans are doing something like this, because when you think about what are Filipino Americans doing in during the pandemic, right. how are they stepping up? That's the history. I mean, well, everything they do is going to be historical, how you respond to your family, how you respond to your community, but to, to try to take it to this level in terms of, of really getting out information, that could be historic. And uh, I hope that Tayo helped dot com and the caretaker project uh you know does well i mean it, it's something that we at the at the uh, at the museum are trying to figure out how do we tell our stories and certainly the story of tayo help is part of filipino american history now so uh, congratulations to the group and stay in touch and we'll we'll talk some more about uh, you know about uh the vaccines, yep. the virus, and I, but you were saying initially that from anecdotal evidence, it seems that people are going to be hesitant, are hesitant at this point about the vaccine. I, and I can't say I don't blame them. I mean, the fact that it's not such a cut and dry thing, right? We, there's still a lot we don't know. I mean, obviously they went through a lot of clinical trials to get to the point that they are now, but you know, I mean, it's fear of the unknown, right? It's such a human, trait um but at the same time if we are all trying to get back to some level of no normalcy at some point i think so we're gonna have to make that call like when is it safe i think it's a matter of really when not if but maybe for some people maybe never i don't know but yeah. you know so. yeah it's a tough one but i think yeah. that for for me personally i think i'm i'm so far back in line that by the time it gets to me, they'll know I'm right more. behind you. <laughs> I'm right behind you. So they'll know more and more about yeah. the vaccine. But I, I all right, more immediately, how about the holidays? How about getting together? Are people I, I say this is the this is the holiday where you you do it virtually. Yeah. And that's what we're basically trying to tell people because that's the only that is the only way you can really truly prevent the spread is you just stay with the people that's in your household don't you know don't invite people don't go to places that you're not already part of that bubble 
because you just don't know. It's like it's hard. It's I wish it was easy that you can tell who has it, who doesn't. You don't know. You could even have it and you don't know. And you're unknowingly spreading it. And that's what it's dangerous about. And I don't think anybody would want that on their conscience. You know, like I think that's the last thing anybody wants. So I mean, as tough as it is, but I guess at the end of the day, it's everyone's individual choice. But I'm just saying for the collective good, really think about what you're doing, you know, for the, it's not just about you, it's about for other people. And I don't know what's more Filipino than that. I mean, you know, you go to, you, and you know this, cause we're both Filipino, but like for the, I'm trying, I try to explain it to people that are not Filipino. So it's like, if you ever have a Filipino friend or you ever go to a Filipino party, you know, the first thing they ask is like, did you eat? You know, it's that spirit of kapla, right? It's like, because we know it's us. It goes back to us because we know by feeding you, we're feeding ourselves too. And I think the same principle can apply here is that by us being away, we're also saving you as well. So I think it's maybe reaching, reaching back deep into that cultural value and like adapting it. And that's what we do best as Filipinos, right? So yeah. Hey, uh, Lizelle Tanglao, thank you very much for sharing your Filipino American story here in terms of COVID and the vaccine virus and what you're doing with all the good people at tayohelp.com. That's T A Y O means us, tayo, T A Y O help.com for information. And um, we'll have you back and to talk yeah. about what, what Tayo Help is you know, more that Tayo Help is doing as you get more information, as you spread it out to, to the people. And uh, we'll just talk in general about the media because I think your perspective- oh, I would love to talk media with you. <laughs> I have many thoughts. So. The, the perspective as a young Filipino American journalist uh, with the media landscape, it's important because if, if the media landscape were serving us, there would be no need for Tayo Help, right? I mean, I, I think I, in many ways, yeah, I think I, I think that's that's true, because like what we're trying to do, we're, we're trying to fill that space that doesn't exist, that is currently not there, you know, trying to bridge that gap. And who's more bridge people than we are as, yeah. you know, yeah. as, as children of immigrants, we bridge, we've been bridge people all our lives. So it's almost poetic when you think about like why we're doing this is because we've been bridge we've been building bridges all our lives so this is just another extension of that so. well i i like i said i appreciate your time uh and your your reaching out to the museum and for noticing even noticing the museum we 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 try to you know tell our story on the weekend and uh, really thanks a lot lizelle and so thank you so much with all your work uh, with Fonz and the museum. I've been a longtime member as well. And it's just so important to, to have a place to record all of this because who's going to do it if we don't, you know? So thank you so much. Okay. All right. Thanks, Lizelle. And I'll, I'll let you go now so you can, and I'll talk to you again soon. Okay. All right. Merry Christmas, by the way. Merry Christmas. Bye. All right. Lizelle Tanglao. I, I've known Lizelle for, for some time. And, uh, you know, she just, it's, it's unfortunate in a way that she didn't come into the media when I was coming up because she's another one of those young firecracker type reporters who could have done anything in a three network world. But when it's so crowded, it's she, as she said, it's, it's so hard to, to break in now. The diversity isn't there. And, um, but she's found something entrepreneurial that she can do that where she has found a way to use her journalistic skill to get the information out there to Filipino Americans who are not served and specifically Filipinos who need information on COVID and soon on the vaccine. Tayohelp.com is the name of the website, Lizelle Tanglao. So um, I'm Emil Guillermo. Uh, this is our museum pop-up. I know we have uh, some, it seems like we don't have any technical issues, but you know, excuse me, that you know that that can't be true. Cause I see, I can see, you know, maybe our, our screen has been lagging, but uh, I hope that uh, on the record on the uh, when when it posts you'll see the full 
uh, interview with Lizelle and you'll see more of the whole thing and it's not gulu gulu it, that it's it works uh, so at this point I'm going to say enjoy your Saturday folks tomorrow we'll be back with the Sunday brunch hopefully completely trouble free um, look for us to talk about this week in Filipino history an extension of Pearl Harbor tomorrow's the 13th and the 13th, some significant things happened in terms of the Filipino American response to Japanese Americans. We'll talk about that. We'll also go back in history, uh, December 9th, a key moment uh, when uh, in 1932, guess what? Did you know there were Filipinos at UC Berkeley? Yeah, 1932. I mean, it's, it's amazing, but I guess that's part of that whole illustrato thing and part of people coming from the Philippines early on they weren't just in the fields they were UC Berkeley I'll talk about some other things this week in Filipino especially rich Filipino American history especially rich that's tomorrow on the Sunday brunch uh, oh one more thing and now you might have noticed my gong Lizelle when we were talking she was talking about the gong we got the Kulintang gong we got the Benny Agbayani jersey number 50 Hawaiian punch Signed by Benny. Okay, uh, but we also have, I'm wearing this, which is a gong necklace from my good friend, Ty Buchholt. Uh, she had them for sale. I said, I want one of those. Because that way I don't have to bang my gong. I can just shake it sometimes and I won't be as annoying. Uh, anyway, I think she's all sold out of them, but that's uh, why I'm wearing uh, this. Uh, it's not Indian not Native American, not South Asian. It's Filipino. I'm Emil Guillermo. Emil, I'm up to you. Thank you for joining us. I'll talk about my show tomorrow, too, which uh, had an interesting run uh, on Monday. Uh, if you missed it, uh, I may have a way for you to uh, partake coming up. Uh, thank you again. Um, as my good friend, the late Professor Don Mohalana Mabalan would say, Mahals and Salaman.